A routine. Ainsley. Grant. Anita. Ariel. Joseph. Josh. Dean. Jason. And Bob. Hello everyone, good to see you all. And you all know what it's all about, the same old, same old. Been going on for years, it's still <laughs> happening. Non-duality, meaning one without a second, not two. And, uh, and they say in the Bible, in the beginning, no, no. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst. And what did Moses say on a mountain when he realised, I am that I am. Now is there anyone in this room who's not saying I am? And that's what they're talking about, that's the one essence. Which is in everything and everyone. And we all know that. That's why I say I can't teach you anything. I can't tell you anything. All I can do is point toward and ask you to look to where I'm pointing to, to see for yourself. Because if it's all the one, not the, there is nobody who can teach you anything, or, or nobody that can tell you anything. Or another way I put it, I'm not speaking to anybody. I'm not speaking to any mind. I'm not speaking to that I am identity that you might believe yourself to be, but some of you already don't see through it, but, which is a good thing. I'm not speaking to anybody. I'm speaking to that I am, that I am, and that I am is the sense of presence, the knowing that you are. And everyone is aware of being present right now, and everyone is, knows that I am. Just to this and nothing else. So that's what we try and point out here. And a lot of you I know that come here have recognised it already. And others might be hearing it for the first time or hear it a few times and still got questions about it. But we go over it again and again and again. Just the same, though we don't realise it, when you first learned words and your parents told you, I am little Jane or little Billy. And from then on, you've gone over that many, many times until it becomes the norm or the ordinary. You think, oh, I am this Billy or Johnny, whatever your name might be. Not recognise it, it is the sense of presence. Anyone who, which they call again in the scriptures, describing it as a Sat Chitananda, Nama Rupa, Sat is existence. Chit consciousness, Ananda is loving to be. Now, there's anyone who's not existing? No, you realise, of course, I'm existing. Anyone who's unconscious or unaware? And you know, I'm not unaware, I'm not unconscious. And anyone who doesn't want to be right now, if somebody was coming along and said, I'm going to kill you, you wouldn't be too happy about it. So you're all happy to be. So if that's what they describe it, and all the ancient texts that recognise that you are already that. And then the search itself becomes the problem. And that's why they say, again, we're here and don't take any notice. What you are seeking, you already are. And that's the fact. There is nobody who is not that. And that, though, according to, is the one essence, the sense of presence that expresses and through the mind as the thought I am. And Shakespeare tells us there's nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes you so. How many words were you born with? You weren't born with any words. So you didn't learn any words till a couple of years older, so you realise you are prior to the word. And all these words are of mind. You are prior to the mind. So, 
That's what we need to look at and investigate. This idea that we are the separate entity, the individual, the person. When you look at it really, it all comes down to the words we've learnt. How can you say you were born? Because you didn't have any words when you were born. And you can't remember your birth. People say they remember their birth, but how could you? How could you say I was born when you had no words and you had no concept of time before you got the word? So you couldn't. Uh, there again, it points out that you are prior to mind, prior to thought. But when we take on the thought, take on the idea we are this separate entity, that's where all our problems come from. The belief that we are this individual, this person. And even the word person, when you look it up, it comes from the ancient Latin persona, the mask. Pointing out we've got this conceptual image or mask and we hide behind that mask. I am Bob, I'm so and so, I'm this, I'm that, and other, all the other concepts we've taken on board that I believe myself to be. And that can come into all different words. I can be unhappy, I can be fearful, anxious, depressed, guilty, all of these different labels and take on the belief that I am. And that's taking on that belief, that's how it appears. And Wei Wu Wei tells you, why are you unhappy? Because if you say, think you say, everything you do and everything you see is for yourself. And he says there isn't one. There is no personal self. And there is no self. Those of you who looked into these traditional religions and all the rest of it, we've got this idea we are this person, we are this separate entity, we are this self. And most of them that understand it will say there's only one self, the so-called Atman self. There's no personal self at all. There is no person. Because they tell you again when you look at it, it is the basic space of phenomena. The base of everything in this manifestation is space. Space has no beginning to it. Can you find a beginning to it? Look into these things and see for yourself. Can you find a centre to it? Can you find any boundaries, any limitations? You can't. Space is no thing. But try and postulate or think of something that can be outside of space. What would it be in? It'd have to be in something, so it must be the so-called space that it's in. So they call it space-like awareness. That awareness is not a word of putting such an end of existence, consciousness, awareness of being is bliss. Now that space-like awareness is what you are if we put the different labels patterns, shapes and forms and take ourselves to be these separate entities and see how that functions. As Shakespeare told you four, three or four hundred years ago, he says there's nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. And have a look at the way you think and realise that is so. You're always thinking in the interrelated pairs of opposites. Either in the past, which is memory, the future, which is anticipation, imagination, and in that range it's either good or bad, pleasant, painful, happy, sad, loving, hating, positive, negative, here or there, high or low, or vibrating in the pairs of opposites. And that's when it's looked into, that's all it is, a vibrating pattern of energy. And they call it another way, they put it as intelligence energy, instead of using the term God. Intelligence is knowing. 
anyone who is not knowing right now, yes, of course you're knowing. An energy is an activity, a movement. So intelligence is active. Energy is the activity of knowing, the movement. And that movement is going on right now. Breathing you, beating your heart, causing thoughts to arise, feelings, patterns, shapes and forms, everything are patterns of that energy. And it's a fuse of that knowing or intelligence. You know what it is. And we put other labels on to discriminate instead of seeing it as that. That's the great mantra. You heard that, and how much notice have we taken of it? Oh, you see, that's, I know that. But when you look at it, everything is that. And you know it already. Because that's the chair I'm sitting in. That's the room the chair's in. That's the space in the room. That's the tree. That's the flower. That's the bird. Everything is already that which we've learnt words and discriminated with the words, seemingly separated into separate entity when it, everything is that. So that basic space, space is no thing. It hasn't got any boundaries, it hasn't got any centre hasn't got any limitations, any substance, or any independent nature. But we don't realise the very first thing you see. What are you seeing out of now? You're seeing out of your eyes. What's the first thing you see? Most of us will say, I see you, or I see this, the things in the room. But the very closest thing to your eyeballs is that space. And you realise that everything in this room and everywhere else is the content of space why they call it the basic space of phenomena. And that phenomena is absolute. What can you add to absolute? Or in Buddhism they call it the great perfection. What can you add to the perfect? You can't add anything to the perfect. It wouldn't be perfect if you could. You can't add anything to absolute. It wouldn't be absolute. You recognise that you are the Absolute. Who or what could ever be superior to you? And you realise there's nothing that can be superior to the Absolute. If it's Absolute, I must be that. And whatever I'm thinking is other <coughs> must be that also, that one. No, you can't add anything to the Absolute. There's no one superior to you, no one inferior to you. And what would you want from anybody else? And all these wars and things going on, people want this and want that country and want something else, and fights and arguments over what to try to acquire or trying to become this, that or the other, all because of that belief they're separate. You recognise your true nature and realise that you're being lived by for now. You're not deliberately taking that breath you're taking now. You're not deliberately beating your heart. It's going on naturally, effortlessly and spontaneously. Then realise instead of trying to become something, and that's another thing, we call ourselves human beings. And we say being, knowing and loving to be, is that such an end or in different terms again? call yourselves human beings, you believe in God, there's something separate, you'll say God is the supreme being. What happens if you ask yourself the simple question? Or we'll take that word human away. Human being, take the word human away. Take the word supreme away. Anyone in this room can jump up and say, oh, I'm not being. You can't, because you know you are being right now. And being will never be becoming, because becoming implies a future time. And when you look into time and investigate time and ask the simple question, can there be a past if I don't think about it? Well, have a look at that. 
and you realise there can't be a past without a thought, and there can't be a future without the thought. And Shakespeare again tells us there's nothing either good or bad, but thinking like to say. And realise we're either believing we're in the past, which is yesterday, it's gone, or in tomorrow, which is anticipation and imagination. Try and go back and live yesterday. You realise you can't live yesterday. You might recall some of it, and when you'll be recalling it, you'll be recalling it right now. So it won't be recalled in the past. It'll be a past, seeming past event brought into the now, refreshed and brought up again. The future, you can't anticipate and imagine the future. Imagine the future. So you can't, you might be thinking, what am I going to do when I leave here? But it won't be the future, will it? It'll be imagining. Anticipate and imagining. So past and future are all conceptual. What about this immediacy, now? Well, have a look at that. When does now begin? Well, I'm aware right now. I'm knowing right now. It's beginning. Does it end? Or is it still right now? Realize the right now doesn't begin or doesn't end. It is spontaneous. It's natural. It's always there. And we lose sight of it by going into the concept of time, past and future, pleasant and painful and all the rest of it. These are things that need to be looked at because they tell us again that the false cannot stand up to investigation. And they say, know the truth. And the truth will set you free. You've got to see that to be free from this conceptual image that you are this separate entity that's fearful, anxious, depressed, guilty, unhappy, suffering. Recognise it's only a concept, a mental concept, a thought. And the Buddha calls this livingness, he calls it a cognizing emptiness. And he made the statement that emptiness is form. And he turned it around the other way, and the forms can be nothing other than the emptiness. So not be cognizing and putting the labels, forms and empty on it, that's all it is. It hasn't changed its true nature from the space-like awareness or emptiness. It has that capacity of knowing or cognizing. Definition, definition of phenomena is that which appears to be. And all this, everything in this room and everywhere else is appearing to be so right now. But it's not, things are not how they appear, how they seem to be. So they call this manifestation an adornment of space. Nothing you can say is that everything is the content of space. But space is no thing. Can something come from no thing? It can't. So you and I are things. The carpet on the floor, the room, the trees, the flowers, everything in manifestation are things which we discriminate again by putting the labels on the words. And in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. All things were made by Him, by the Word. And there was nothing made that was made without the Word. Isn't that so? Haven't we got words for everything? Uh, when, you, when did you begin? You can't remember your birth, and you didn't begin till you were about two, or two, or somewhere around that age when the first words you learned. So you didn't begin as that person until you learnt the words. Here it's fussing around you. You told you're little Billy or little Jane or whatever your name might be. Instead of seeing the reality of it, they didn't tell you that you were absolute because they didn't know themselves. 
You took on the label, I am little Billy or little Jane or little Johnny, whatever the name was. Somebody asks you today, who are you? say, oh, I'm Jane or I am Bill. We've taken that belief to be real. We don't say that I am the absolute. You can't really go around saying it because the majority of people don't realise that and they'll put you in the funny part. You think you're claiming to be God or the absolute. But the word God is just another label, as you see yourself. But you're prior to the word. And you see that the word's not real when you look into the word. Take the word water. Try and drink the word. Try and swim in it. See if you can drown in it. Take the word fire. Cook with the word. Eat yourself with the word. Burn yourself with the word. You can't. So what's this word, I or me? <coughs> so it's just another vibration, another label we put upon ourselves. Now if you went to a department store to buy a dress or a shirt and you came out with a label, dress shirt, you wouldn't be too happy. You'd want the thing itself. Well, why don't you do the same with this? Instead of coming out with a word, have a look and see that I am a little bit more than the word. I cannot negate the beingness. I cannot negate the knowingness. I cannot negate that love of being. I love to be. I don't want to be dead. And as far as this person goes, what's this person? Who well, tells me that I am the body, I am the mind, these thoughts. Well, investigate that. Am I the body? And innately you already know you're not the body because you say my body. You don't say my car. You say my car, but you know you're not the car. You don't say, you say my house, but you know you're not the house. Mm. And you know you're not the this thing or that thing. Well, maybe you're not the body either when you investigate it. But when you do investigate, you see, it won't stand, the false doesn't stand up to investigation. What's this body made up of? See, it's made up of elements. Made up of air, earth, fire, space, water. Take those elements out of your body. Stop drinking the water. See how long it lasts without that or not. Take the fire, the body temperature. You see, you get hypothermia and die. Get out of space if you can. You see, you can't get out of space. Get off the earth. You can't. So, realise that all these words can be broken down, but you are prior to the word. You're before the word. And now you realise, look back, when if I didn't know any words until I was two, two and a half, I lived for that period without the word, so I can't necessarily have to be the word. Though I didn't know what was going on because I had no words, but I was that pure life, that pure being, that pure functioning intelligence energy, just like the nature around you. Nature's not saying, I am the earth that I'm going to roll around the sun. Or I am the wind that's going to cause the storm or the waves. Or I am the mountains or the hills or the stars or the planets. It doesn't say that at all. But it's all expressing as those things that we put the labels or words on and discriminate everything with the word. And the, as I pointed out then, the word's not the thing. What about this word mind? My mind will show me a thing called mind if you believe I own the mind. I can't show anybody a thing called mind because there's no such thing. What we call mind is again thinking or words. We put the label on it, mind. And what is mind? When you investigate it, it sees a sound. It's a vibration. 
It's a word. It's a concept. It's a thought. So all these things are appearing on this awareness or in this what in this space like awareness. They're all appearing in that so it's just nothing but the content of space like everything else. So the word is not the thing. We use words to discriminate and describe things. And that's why they tell you when you look at this thing, the description is not the described. And the description will never be the described. So what we're describing here will never be its description. But it will give you a good pointer towards it. And in the looking and seeing it for yourself, you'll realise that it is so. You are prior to the word, you're not the word. There is no such thing as I. I is a mental concept, a thought, an idea. And can the thought I see actually see? Well, you realise the thought I see can't see. The seeing is happening through the eye. And it's translated by the thought I see. But it's not the eye seeing. Ask yourself, what's the next thought going to be? And you'll tell me I don't know. You don't know, but a thought will come up, won't it? And when that thought comes up, what do you do? You say, I think this thought. We grasp it and capture it with that concept or image we have about I. Well, I think now we become the subject. The next thought would become the subject. I am thinking. I'm thinking this thought. The thought has become the object. So there it is, there's a vision, the split, instead of seeing everything as it is. Now there's me or I and the other, not me or not I. Dualism. And it goes on from there. And we continue to stay in this dualism. And seeing, seeing that, and we recognise that as two separate things, good and bad, pleasant and painful, not recognising what they say, it's all the one essence. There is only the one essence or the one life that's appearing and expressing as everything. But now we've got two. I like it or I don't like it. This is good, that's bad. I am happy, I'm unhappy, I'm fearful, or I'm at peace. It's all divided into the pairs of opposites now with words. But what happens if I see it's all the one essence, the words do not divide, good and bad are two ends of the one stick, high and low are two ends of it, and near and far. Good and bad, all, all, all these vibrates into seeming two are not. It's only two sides of the one six, two sides of the one coin. And you see how that functions in nature. We'll look out there in nature right now. That's where we talk to nature. Nature is the natural state. How things are naturally functioning, shaping, patterning and forming. Look out there in nature, it's daylight. This part of the earth is facing toward the sun. And it's the nature of the earth to revolve. It's turning around, it's revolving all the time. And as it turns around, it faces away from the sun and becomes dark. Now we've got daylight and dark. Does the earth know anything about daylight and dark? It doesn't. Does the sun know anything about daylight and dark? It doesn't. But we discriminate and describe it, we divide it into two. When it's two essence, two sides of the one coin. Because as it's daylight here, later on it'll be dark. And it'll be light again. As it here, it's 
going on for winter. What are we doing about that? Won't be long before it comes spring. And what do we do about that? Nothing. Then it'll turn into summer. And that'll come into autumn and the winter. Who or what is doing any of that? We think we're doing everything with the thinking and these thoughts come up and we think, I think. That thought, I think, becomes the object. I or me becomes the subject, the seeming person. And the seeing person is just a conceptual image. It's not real. Because you and I are just the same as nature. Leave the thoughts as they are. When something good, bad comes up, we try and keep it there. Not realising that it will never stay there. Everything in its manifestation is transient. It's constantly changing. And the good thoughts won't stay there. But we don't want it to go. But no matter how much you love them, how much you want to keep it in, how much you try, it doesn't stop it from going. It's going to go, we don't want it to go, so we resist it. In that struggle, we try to keep it there. We struggle with it. And resistance is conflict. So we get into conflict with resisting all these thoughts. And that conflict's come up all the time, the fear, the anger, the depression, the unhappiness, all because we're resisting something. Resistance, conflict and disease because that resistance makes you uneasy. You're fighting with it, you're struggling with it. Something comes up and you don't like it. Oh, I'm doing the wrong thing here. I shouldn't be thinking that. That's the wrong thing. I'll get into trouble. I'm a sinner. I'm evil and all the rest. So we're resisting. At first one we're trying to keep there. Now we're resisting that, this other one for being there. We want to get rid of it. So again in conflict and disease. So you see, well, we're constantly unhappy and in fear and all the prison. We're constantly al going along with these concepts and the resistance and things that are going on instead of leaving things as they are, unaltered, unmodified, uncorrected. And look and see how that works in nature. You go outside on a cloudy day, would you say the sun's not in the sky? Now the clouds can seemingly obscure the sun. You don't see the sun. But you and I know because of investigation that the sun doesn't leave the sky. But when you ask when you ask what forms the cloud <laughs> when you ask what forms the cloud, you'll see, realise that the sun itself forms the cloud. The sun continues to shine and radiate. And in that heat and radiation, what does it do? It evaporates water. It evaporates water, the water rises and condenses and cools down and forms the cloud. Now the sun doesn't know anything about the cloud. But it forms the cloud which seemingly obscures it. Now the sun continues to radiate, that's all it does, it radiates and shine. And might cause a wind to stir or cool things down and blow the cloud away. But that's happened. It just happened naturally and effortlessly. There's not somebody doing it. Like the same with this livingness. We think we are doing it. But we don't. It's that same life that's beating your heart, growing your hair and fingernails, digesting your food, that's doing the lot. And you are that life. So Christ told you, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. People think he's talking about himself, but he's not. He's talking about that life, that animating life, that's your intelligence energy 
that you are. That's the way to go. Stay with it. How did you come about? Well, investigate that. And you'll say, I was born, but you don't remember your birth. You don't know. But how did you come about? Well, go back as far as your father and your mother. That animating life essence, that intelligence energy in your father, through the food he's eaten and the breath he's taking and what he's living on and all the rest of it, enabled in that pattern a little microscopic particle called a sperm to form. You can't see it with the naked eye. It's nothing. But that sperm was suffused with intelligence, suffused with life. It knew what to do. The same in your mother. That animating life essence in your mother enabled in that pattern another microscopic product called an egg or an ovum to form. That ovum was suffused with intelligence. It knew what to do. It attached itself to all the uterus. And the sperm, knowing what to do, swam to the ovum. Again pointing out it was just the bubba goo. It knew what to do. It was suffused with that life. And the sperm, knowing what to do, and those two mingled and doubled the activities going on in them and formed the little embryo, the little fetus, which is what you are today. What were you doing about it then? Nothing at all. What are you doing about it now? Nothing at all. But it's happening. That was all along. So, Paris energy plays around and forms Pattern shapes and forms, things break down, go away, and pattern more pattern shapes and forms. What they call in some of the scriptures the sport of Shiva, or the dance of Shakti, Shiva Shakti, Shiva the static aspect, the godliness, if you like. Shakti is called his consort, his partner. So Shiva's static aspect, Shakti vibrates and dances and forms the world. And what's that vibration? Energy. So it's all intelligence energy that's vibrating, pattern and shaping, forming. That's what you are, what I am, and what everything is. Now we came out of that space. And where do you go? when you die. Well, life goes out of that pattern you call the body. Where does it go? Well, if you're, you're lucky, your parents might buy a coffin and put you in the coffin, you'll die in that. You'll be in that. And you'll start to rot in that. Or they'll put you in the fire and burn you. And when they say ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Well, that's where you go. And what happens to those ashes and dust when they break down even further? They'll break down into space again. So there it goes. And out of that space, more pattern shapes and forms will form. But it won't be reincarnation because you'll never get the same pattern out of it again. Now, reincarnation is another myth, we believe. But we fresh a new life, which is constantly happening. Now that's what is necessary. It was necessary for this pattern, it mightn't be for yours, but within that conceptual functioning, the way it was, with all the unhappiness and things were going on, causing a great amount of misery and happiness, when the recognition, when it dawned on me that to recognise and look into and find the true nature, and as Banky, a Zen monk in the 16th century, he called it the unborn Buddha mind. And he made the statement then that everything is perfectly resolved in the unborn. Why exchange the unborn for thought? And there it is. We've learnt thought, we've taken on these thoughts and believed them to be real. And look at the strife we get ourselves into. If you're not exchanging it for thought, leaving it as it is, the thoughts will appear, be acted on or not out of it. But the energy of belief that they're this, that and the other, 
won't go into them. So, that's what needs to happen. We need to look into these things and investigate. And see that everything is that essence. And I'm running out of words at the moment. <laughs> and that'll do, anyway. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, Thank you Thanks. Thanks. No, Kat, where is she? about 25 to 30 people with us uh, and we have a lot of welcoming messages and thank you messages but not much of a questions or contributions again but uh, so we start from inviting you guys to actually bring up anything that stood out you want to start um, Nina uh, so, uh, sorry yeah, we'll just second. get the mic Bob, you mentioning how got my my thoughts started going. Um, why don't I get the Why don't I get the listener in so I can hear? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Bob, you is it turned on? It's really just to record. It's not a. Oh, is that it? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, Bob, you mentioning how got the word got my thought process going. Mm. And the word hell. the the word fear came into it for me, and the word indoctrination when I investigated. But I found a funny side to it. You said something about your parents putting you in a coffin and you get burnt, and I thought, when I investigated, maybe it's that that's creating something within me. Um, I just sort of saw a, another side to it when you mentioned um, if your parents put you in a coffin or you're in a coffin then the burning sensation of some people take that they do that when people go um, I don't know it was just an investigation and I saw, sort of saw the ridiculous and funny side of it instead of being fearful of burning in hell like a nun told me I would if I didn't behave myself. <laughs> I got taken to the burner at the school and he said if you don't behave you're going to burn in hell like that. And <laughs> so it's really great. I sort of cleared that stupidity, that indoctrination through you mentioning it. I just, it's just nothing overly serious but interesting I mm. thought mm. yeah, yeah. <laughs> about four days ago I was trying to remember my most favourite quote by the Shakespeare of non-duality way 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 and you said it Bob <laughs> which one was it um, I've forgotten it again I just had it just then <laughs> <laughs> why, 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 what? No, why will I? No, no, it's, it's, um... Everything you do, everything you think yes. is for yourself. Yeah, everything you say, why, why are you so unhappy? Because everything you say, do or think is for yourself and there isn't one. <laughs> and before I came to Australia, I was tramping in the New Zealand mountains for like three or four months doing two-week tramps at a time plus. And in every hut book, I'd write that on the inside cover of the hut book <laughs> to, just to blow out the uh, people that were tramping. My next favourite one. Vandal. Yeah. <laughs> something cosmic when you're out in the bush. The other one is my favourite is, what is your problem? Mistaken identity. Simple. 
That's beautiful. He's brain melting. His stuff is fantastic. <laughs> Yeah, so we only have love and blessings from different parts of the world. And Tasha, wonderful. I've always got something to say. Wonderful. Um, this is kind of really weird and cool. During the week, I was meditating quite heavily or deeply. And um, what happened was the localization of Tasha left the building. And then there was just maybe, maybe it was just presence. I'm not sure. There was just awareness. And it was quite nice. And then the mind apparatus started being flooded with images, thoughts, feelings, sensations that have absolutely nothing to do with Tasha, her history, her normal thought patterns. Mm. It was just so foreign. It was like as if there was a foreign movie or something placed in the thinking apparatus and obviously there was some form of Tasha there because it was like as if this thinkingness was I don't know up in the sky mm. outside of the localized brain area and it was like that's fucking weird man like that that would happen but I, I think the 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 takeaway is that there was no body, no identification. There was just a thinking apparatus thinking. Mm. And its usual patterning was not there. Then there was the viewing of um, almost like overlapping thoughts, memories, sensations, images, Tasha-isms. And they almost like came in a collage overlapped in a collage and the more that that consolidated and became more localized the more me mm -hmm. came back and the less maybe it's boundlessness was mm -hmm. there I don't really know the right words oh, but it was yeah. kind of nice and then for, so for the next few days there was extreme anxiety like extreme anxiety as well as no desires and peace and I don't know how you can have extreme anxiety and peace at the same time because neurologically and physiologically they're actually not possible because you're calling on two different parts of the nervous system. So I don't even know how to make sense of that. Like, I really don't care either. Yeah. Anyway, I'm just rambling, but I just thought I'd share that because it was weird. Mm. And I don't really know what that is, but it was nice. Yeah. Not taking part with your nervous system, you're going beyond that. You're going into the absolute itself. So you, when you couldn't relate it to anything, you know. Mm. But then you bring it back and sort of fine it, fine hide it up into the believed in self centre and lose sight of it. But you're in touch with the the absolute when you open up to it. Because you don't know what your next thought's gonna be. But a thought will come up. Where does it come from? Everywhere. Yeah, it <laughs> comes from the space like a wheel, not in the head. All our thoughts are not in, in the head, which we believe in so I mean, not in the body. You have a head the size of this room or bigger. Yeah, go for Thank it. Thank you. It's um, in, interesting because as more of the overlapping thoughts that form Tasha, as more of Tasha-ism became more localised, Physiologically, there was a sense of feeling a bit seasick, like I, like I wanted to vomit a little bit. Mm. And it's like, oh no, this is not good. Being a human's actually not fun. <laughs> it's like mm. the, yeah, it, I don't know, there was, it was just nothing. Yeah. And that was good. And then, yeah, then yeah, when, the yeah, then I, the conflict. I understand where you're coming from. Yeah. I don't think I've answered the question for you. Yeah, the conflict of the two. Mm. Yeah. Anyway, I would like to be there more often. Fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Should like to be here more often. Oh, I was going to say, um, I haven't been here for a number of weeks, and I, I think I'm, what I'd like to refer to Bob Spiel as, it feels like it's um, like the great reminder <laughs> of what I am 
Um, and what I am here is recognizing what I am through this message. Like it, it hears it and it takes over a lot more and it, it uh, deepens and glows more and it, it's just content and it doesn't need anything. So, um, and I'm noticing though the, the thinking that comes up is the personalization of the thinking is the problem. Like it's taking that thinking to be personal and mine and that's the tricky thing because it can be so, um, such a, a amazing disguise um, in the thinking. But um, yeah, just to see any thoughts at all aren't what I am. But that little me, it's never happy. It's always shitty. It's always trying to rip into itself. It's always trying to, you know fight and like need to get this need to get that you haven't done that good enough blah 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 so i'm just seeing that voice as not it's not personal it's not me it's just there and um yeah the more i come here and this thing grows the more that gets seen through a lot easier every time it comes up I was just going to add, Tash, get used to it. Because when you hit that place where you abide in the nothingness, SHIT still happens because that's your personality mechanism and how it perceives the 3D world that you're in. And it's discombobulating. So um, it doesn't stop that dichotomy is always there. I am the nothingness attached to a Jason guy. Jason guy that bits of me I don't like, bits of me lots of people don't like. And is the divinity here at the same time? So for instance yesterday I was in a situation where I was around someone who's a bit unhinged, potentially violent. I was still blissed off my face while aspects of me were absolutely bleep 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 angry. But the energy was cranking. <laughs> A bit like it is now. And that becomes the dichotomy. What is your problem? Mistaken identity. So who are you identified as? Tash or nothing? That establishes the nothing you'll still have Tash. And Tash will still have, need to have a good strong ego because if she doesn't, she'll either end up in a padded cell <laughs> or she'll turn into a cult master and do stuff that's boundary violating. So it, it's weird. Don't ever get, you won't ever get used to it, but you become accustomed to it. Thank you. That is one way of presenting it. And if it resonates, beautiful. Use it. Take it. Uh, another way of presenting it is ultimately realizing that there isn't anyone there to identify a small self, medium self, big self, <coughs> subconscious, superconscious, God, nothing. There isn't anyone here who would require any identity. Just finding, because as a totality, yes, all those voices, narrative, commentary, all are present. As a totality, also that blank, <coughs> empty screen is present. And it doesn't have qualities <coughs> and it doesn't have desires. And it isn't really a job to disidentify from the personality and identify as a screen, because who would be doing that? There is a place already to relax into where no identification is required whatsoever. That's that resting place in which whatever shows up, whether there is a nasty narrative, pleasant narrative, whether there is a nausea or whatever shows up, <coughs> is just whatever shows up on the screen. A screen doesn't care. It doesn't have preference. Personality will. Of course, the body will always be wired for pleasure above, above pain. The mind will always be complaining because that's its job. 
I love when Adrian was saying that, you know, when you find that thinking, that habitual commentary, being just a function, completely impersonal, that's what it does, because that's how it achieves the so-called improvement, that's how it seeks the survival, how it facilitates finding the most comfortable uh, option for the whole vehicle, and without the vehicle, the the so-called awareness, which doesn't even exist, it does or it doesn't, or it's both. Does. It, it can't experience itself, it can't express itself. So the vehicle, in a way, like Bob was expressing, which that potentiality created for itself, grew it from a little fetus or a little cell to be able to see and hear, otherwise it can't. Well, it can through other vehicles. But even that story is a little far-fetched because it, it creates the time, that that was the time through which that has been happening, while it is just a back story which we are seeing in that moment of unfolding. But either way, if, if there is a landing place within that sphere of awareness where there is no need to identify as anything, and whatever shows up, whether there is a personality, whether it is anxiety, whether it is a pleasure, it's completely impersonal. It's just the content of space. And there's no one who needs to shift from here to there. Well, that's the, that's the ultimate freedom. But if there is a situation in which, okay, I'll talk myself into, oh, I am space now. I'm not a little me, I'm the big me, and it feels a little bit happier. Well, that's how life unfolds. That's perfect, too. Whatever works. From this sort of um, gymnastic, there is also a space in which it is being perceived, in which you can see that shift from small identity to big identity, or from self-loathing to self-acceptance, or any of those tricks, psychological tricks that happen in the different therapies. There is a space in which all those movements are happening, and that you are, ultimately. But yeah, whichever way the life Anita. Yeah, I love that. That's a lovely description. And also Bob's pointer about everything appears to be happening, but mm. it's happening within intelligent space, an mm. intelligent knowing, which nothing can appear without boundaries, and the boundaries are happening within spaciousness, yes. so against spaciousness. Mm. It's like a shadow play. Mm -hmm. So beautiful uh, pointer that one, uh, you know that really hit me today. Yeah. Mm. <coughs> Thank you so much, Bob and Kat and everyone. <laughs> um, thanks, Bob and Kat. Um, I, I know that resting place that, you know, you speak mm -hmm. of and I, and I, um, can be in that a lot of the time, yet there's this, the thing that, that, um, I'm just trying to formulate it because there's been a lot of, Lots, a lot of shifting's been happening, especially since I've been coming to see you in the last, um, you know, months. But it seems to be even more so recently. There's been some, let's put it this way, revelations to to me about family and other other things like that that have brought up certain conflicts in me, which pull me out of that space, and. Um, um, especially with my father, but you know, within the the family, there's been things that have come up, and um, it also brings back historical things in me and about my own view of myself and 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 understandings, and um, I find it really hard to to come out of that. Um, I guess anger and resentment towards myself and situations, I can see that that's not mm. the place. I've, I've got a sense of, you know, the the being pulled out of, um, sorry, or 
pulled into thought and 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 the various emotions and things that are going on i get glimpses of the the spaces in between that where there is you know separation or that that awareness mm. yet like over the last few days i found it incredibly difficult to pull back from the 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 turmoil so i don't even know where i'm going with that but yes i can see the difference i can see that that's not that's not essentially me and it's happening in space but the the effects of that are really quite powerful and ongoing mm. so i don't even know what the question is but just a just mm. a s statement of like yeah it seems I just got to stay with it, I guess. But that's it. I guess that's yeah. the only thing is just mm. sit in that awareness of whatever's going on, mm. allow it to come yeah. and just sit with it and see where that takes me, I, I guess. Exactly, yeah. So, yeah, but being here and hearing everyone's experiences allows me to... Mm see that difference anyway that i don't just relate to yeah. the functioning of the emotional space or i can see that it's happening in a broader context let's put it that way mm. that's all yeah that's that's beautiful and i'm sorry that you're going through that because of course you know any sense of any sense of discomfort whether it is a physical pain or there is emotional pain of course is undesirable and all the forces of that body-mind vehicle will be resisting that sort of a thing. But again, there is a resting place in which the ultimate freedom is, regardless whether there is a physical pain or there is an emotional pain or there is a resentment showing up, whatever is showing up is just what life is experiencing at this moment. And to not wishing it away, actually to find a place in which the wishing it away is part of the landscape. Mm. And yeah, the resentment is here. The wish to be loving and not resenting is here. And I am the space for both of them to be until they are not. Because resisting the feeling will actually just, you know, it's like pulling the oil on the fire. We will keep it growing. It, resistance is the, is the negative attention, but still the attention mm -hmm. that fuels it. Finding that soft spot in which, oh yeah, okay. There is a pain, physical, mm -hmm. emotional, whatever. Can I just add one more thing yeah, yeah, yeah. to it? Just, um, I'm also noticing that, so my, my immediate person in front of me at the moment is my father. And he's, you know, and he's one of my longest relationships, obviously. Mm. Um, and there's a lot of fear in him about his situation, about getting close to, um, he's, he's, he's not well and um, he's fearful of pretty much losing everything, and which is true, like he will yeah. lose everything he knows, everything he's been, yeah. his physical side of things, his, you know, he, he's constantly clinging to the, the stuff around him, mm. um, the, um, the items, everything that he's done in life to get, you know, the house, the pictures, the furniture, and it's been really grating on on me mm. as well um but i but I, at the same time i realized there's some of that fear in me too about letting go of things and the my my constructs of who and what i am and constructs of what my life is you know and it's not the things but there's an element that still relates to that because that's the me, my stuff. Um, but I've, I've found that um, his like such strong grip on it mm. is causing him so much pain, so much anger, resentment, everything. And I can see that that's also part of, partly in me as well. So I guess by um, seeing what he's going through, I'm seeing what I'm going through. And that's been 
hard but helpful and it's been there's been a lot of stuff that's been brought up with that but um, it's also allowing me to I guess see it and process it now rather than at any other time yeah. but but yeah but it's just um, I can see how much of what he's going through I'm picking up at the moment as well but it's not a bad thing it's just is and it's yeah. it's it's just um, yeah it's just a lot of processing going on but yeah anyway that's but isn't it incredible to actually be able to see how the suffering is constructed yeah yeah Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah, go on, go on, other. Oh, yeah, whoever. Yeah. Uh, mm. You still mixed? Mm. Yeah. No, I, I, I was um, yeah. relating to Timo a little bit, and I was thinking, should I say something or not? Or, and then you spoke about this, and then I thought, oh, I. I came up also with, I don't even know how that all happened, but uh, uh, you spoke about something, and then I thought. Um. Yeah, like there's also stuff happening with me as well, and um, looking at in the the thought patterns of concepts, let's say, or um, ideas of relationship situations you would like to have differently, and discuss about it, and so a lot of disappointment feeling came up and now by last two days sort of reflecting on ah I see um, seeing the disappointment of feeling happened so many times that 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 I realized saw so also because of disappointment anger pattern came up frustration patterns and then further on it came to a point where it gets more quiet and let's say separating no, not sure what the separating is from the idea of the concept. Um, but physically I was like separating as well. And then of course quite a lot of discomfort. Um, until I, yesterday I noticed a bit sadness behind the disappointment and then I thought oh I'm finally there <laughs> um, but it's hard to get to the sadness like to actually cry because then after that it feels more clear and more I say myself in that sense even though we talk about this but it, it came more clear and feels more comfortable um, and uh, I got much more clear on things because of the situation about myself, what I need, let's say, for example, the situations what I complained about that is noisy, more, more like conflicts around me happening, then I was like, oh, what's that about me? Ah, I like it more sometimes quiet. I like it relaxing, not all the time, but I can see then all oh, what I, what is, let's say, the body needs or me need of these sort of topics about myself. And then I noticing all the positive things about, ah, oh, this is what I like. And then I start thinking about, oh, what I like or what I'm looking for. And the more I thought about it, the more happier I got. And then I was more excited about it and I had to share it with people. <laughs> <laughs> so all this happened. So like there's so much happening, so it's really nice. And then um, I noticing then after I got happy, I was like, oh, what is this now? Oh, it's just the thoughts. Oh, the thoughts, thinking about like, you know, complaining and then the thoughts happening that and that 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 thought make your emotion then as well so I got then noticing that oh that's happening again and and so when I was here uh, I was it also thought about that separating as an idea was causing pain but then I realizing I'm physically already separating more already because of the noise and because of this I'm not feeling comfortable around 
So the physical separation around the noise factor being high was already separating me automatically and the rest was just the ideas. Mm. Then having concepts what that separation then look like might make you feel more painful. But it's very complex, but also at the same time it feels quite interesting and clear as well. When I look at that, you know, you walk away from very loud noise because it feels more nicer to be quiet and calmer. Um, so, but then sitting here with Bob and listen to it, I everything looked different and felt different. And I don't even know it's positive or negative. And it felt like um, when I look at Bob's face and then it looks like, oh, I have him before. It looks very different. It's like, was I can't relate to anything like that. Um, of course, I felt more energy as well than sitting here. And it felt sort of more kind of numb, like I couldn't get excited about anything. And I thought, oh, is it like, that's the way I see it without the thought thinking more. Um, I can't say more to that, but it, it, it's just all my experience or the experience I'm having. Um, so sometimes I don't know what I should share or not. And sometimes things happening. And since you spoke it somehow, it's just like, oh yeah, it just happens that way. So I think, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Mm. Um, so I, I think it's really interesting that we get told it's non-conceptual awareness and we spend all this time concentrating and focusing on what the mind is saying, doing, etc. And it's like, I think I've watched the mind now for so many years after, you know, first hearing Bob when he told me, you know, you're not the body, you're not the mind. And like for me, that was the most liberating thing I'd ever heard because I thought, shit, this head, I can't control it. I can't do anything to stop feeling depressed. And then I became apathetic and it was actually delightful to be apathetic instead of depressed, you know, because at least I wasn't giving a shit about things now, you know, because I wasn't doing it. So I kind of let it go and let it do itself. Um, and so, and, and the more I've watched the mind, the more I've realized how unreliable it is. It's, it's not something you can rely on. It's not something, it's always trying to come up with a definitive explanation of what you are, what life is, who you are, what you believe in, and it's constantly changing. There's nothing mm -hmm. constant about it. it. You can't, it can't come up with anything definitive. You can't rely on it. And we get told it, that, that um, heaven is within, but we don't see it, right? right? So, and yet we keep looking outside. We keep looking at who's doing what to who and when and what I own and what I don't own. And all the focus when you're thinking is out there. It's, mm -hmm. it's past, present, it, but it's out there, even bodily even experientially when you're thinking you're actually leaping out of your body you know if you if you instead of looking out all the time just turn in just look in just look in keep your focus inward all the time don't don't as soon as you because because you're already leaping out when you're thinking and you focus even try it right now if you if you shift your focus from the thinking and, and you focus out there and just turn your focus inward, you're already having a completely different, immediately different experience of life. Mm -hmm. It's a completely different way of living, you know. And I know it's, it's fine to say, oh, the mind may think this and the mind may think that. Stuff the mind and what the mind is thinking. <laughs> We're always going out there. And we think it's okay if it thinks this, oh yeah, now it's thinking that, and oh yeah, now it's thinking that, and it's all happening in this. No, stuff it. It's not, it's not something to concentrate on. It's like, you, 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 you are, it's like this iceberg, and you, you're focusing on this aspect of the iceberg, the thought, 
and and you're totally ignoring the the the, the enormity of what is you I'm right kidding. what is you it's like it's like like bob says if you put a magnifying glass at a point and and it's focused there it's going to burn it's going to burn right that's exactly what thinking does it burns it burns you and it's totally conditioned i mean the way i think is based on everything every bit of input the language that i've learned because i've got the words like so for example in germany there's a word and i don't even i always forget what the word is but there's a word that where you enjoy other people's misery there you go i mean to have that concept gives you the idea to have that that feeling and that thought you see it's almost like language and words give you give you the, the context that you can think within right so there's actually there's no validity in thinking i'm not saying it's not functional it works it we, we need to talk and we need to communicate it's happening that's how it's happening but to give our complete focus the way we do on on thinking is is our mistake we need to turn in and and keep the focus that way not out that way and even that even right now you do that and it completely changes your experience and to stay in that internal focus and 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 that is so much more peaceful than what i've got whether i'm going to work tomorrow you know whether i can pay the mortgage whether i all that all that that stuff it's just and you have no control of it either. You can say, oh, I'm going to put the money aside this week to pay for this, and then you don't, right? So you can think all you like, and what happens, happens. So if you just sit back, mm -hmm. relax, it's a different experience. It's a, it's a, even it, bodily, it's a different experience to be turned inward and to keep that inward focus. Just keep it. Keep it there. Don't give... Don't give energy to to thinking that is completely unreliable. Beautiful. That's beautiful. And don't mistake it by thinking about me, that this is the internal focus. No. Thinking about me is yeah. equally external thought. That was beautiful. That was mm. just a wonderful summary. So thinking about what I'm feeling, what I'm experiencing is equally yeah. going out there and creating the images. Go to the non-conceptual, to the sense of presence, which is completely beyond any concepts or any boundaries, any limitations. And I see, uh, you, you have the mic here. Um, I just, my appreciation for being here is profound. <laughs> <laughs> As Bob was speaking, um, tears were, were flowing. Mm. And... Uh, It was, it just, it, it just was, it just is. And um, there was an awareness of, of thoughts that wanted to come up around that, mm. but uh, they didn't hang around. And for, for the perceived person of Ariel, this is quite a vulnerable situation for me to be seen. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, I just wanted to to express my appreciation for for all of you um, for just being in this space. It's it's a really, it's beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Bob McCann. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for thank your courage thank you, and your vulnerability. That's yeah, that is beautiful. And it's yeah. And I have a couple of things that uh, we have our community adding to the to the mix. Uh, Laura says uh, I'm finding here that I'm noticing more that when the dialogue starts, I am more often able to simply say, ah, the story. It is wonderful when that now occurs. And Gilbert says, all movement appears upon stillness. Being is wordless. Be quiet. 
and watch the mind. <coughs> Be conscious of the consciousness. Beautiful. And Giotti says, very grateful to be part of this discussion. Hmm. Yeah, thank you everyone for being part of this. And Laura says, that was when Aleti was saying, that's great, thanks. And Tanya, uh, thank you so much for the reminder not to focus on the thoughts concept. Much needed today. And oops. And Laura says, you're beautiful. It takes one to know one. And I have, <laughs> it is a nice projection to have, to see the beauty, to see the joy, to see the love. And as uh, Joseph was saying, you know, how much easier it is when you are light and happy to notice the thoughts. And when you are in the depth of the darkness, well, that's the trap. Uh, yeah, so see the projection. Uh, there is a, a message from the man who who is not on Facebook, he's he's watching us on YouTube when there is an upload, and that was a comment on on last uh, week's a beautiful highlights from last week's uh, spiel of Bob. <coughs> uh, he says the highlight of what Bob was saying along the ninth uh, line: if one function from a standpoint other than the one that is in com that is in conflict, other if it other than the one, other than just the oneness, that's a conflict. <coughs> and leavingness is happening right now. And he says, Bob has also mentioned the unborn mind, the pure mind, without a thought. I would add to that with the arrival of thought, the concept of the muddied mind arises. And he also says a, a little comment on Bob saying, go and try. <laughs> to leave five minutes ago. <laughs> and, and he just made a nice little poetic, like a little sort of a, a image of it. The man walked backwards down the street, clutching at the impossible notion of turning, turning back time. Each collision with the obstacle mirrored his inner strife, frustration, escalating with every bump. Amidst the chaos, a stark truth emerged. Dwelling in the past only led to regret and turmoil. And you can see how the whole thinking, and I loved, Aleti, what you highlighted about the language. All the thinking is already a framework for communication. It inspires certain way of expression. It is already a past. Language is the past. It's something that re you refer to through the memory. It's not fresh and new. I mean, it's necessary and it's wonderful, but yes, it is. As he says, dwelling in the past only led to regret and turmoil. And another of Bob's phrases that really touched his heart, and I love that too, and who doesn't? The adornment of space. Mm. Everything mm. is just the adornment of space. You may not like it. Who is it that doesn't like it? There's just mm. not liking mm. happening. Also being just an adornment of space. Like Joseph was saying, oh, I like this, I don't like this. If you see it as just an adornment of space. That commentary is saying, I like it. It doesn't mean there is an I with the preference of liking or not liking. It's just the emotional wave of depreciation, whatever, flowing through the space. There's no I that like or dislikes. Although it's fair enough to say in the language, preference for this body is vanilla over chocolate or the other way. Uh, <laughs> the language is wonderful. And he also remarked on my response uh, to Mitra, when you are completely aware of your presence being an empty, vacant field of pure knowing, that is the awareness of nothing. And he created a nice little picture uh, called awareness of nothing. As the woman hung the clothes on a line, uh, she noticed how each garment once hung seems so completely separate in the breeze. But then a realization struck her. Despite the apparent separateness of the clothes, the line, the pegs, the breeze, the her and herself, she realized they were all part of the unified hold, whole. This realization transcended the illusion of separateness, leading to an awareness of nothing where distinctions and boundaries dissolved, revealing the underlying unity and interconnectedness of everything. 
In that simple act of hanging cloth, she glimpsed a deeper truth, a unity beyond words, where each garment represented a thread in the intricate tapestry of life. And this is a great invitation as you go along, as you go alongside, you live your life, that every scene that is unfolding, if that scene includes you cooking or washing the dishes, this is still an adornment of space. This is what is happening within that field of consciousness or knowing that you are. And that includes the body performing the actions. That is all one whole within that one whole. It's not me doing this, and this is separate because the body space, all that. No, it is all one content or one, let's say, projection image on, on one screen. So I have a few more, but we are over time. So if anyone would like to add something yeah. before we go, go. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for your contributions and like. And thank you, Bob, um, thank for your you. relentless and continuous pointing and re Thank you. and Thank and you. it's just amazing and it's always <laughs> it's repetitive but it's absolutely spontaneous it's not there's nothing repetitive about it whatsoever it's just brilliant magnificent mm -hmm. thank you <laughs> yeah and thank you everyone for spoiling us yes too. thank you Bob and Kat <laughs> and for hanging out with us yeah thank you thank you, thank you.